never even scratch the surface. How could he? Evolution backwards to the age of the reptile. Half human. Half lizard. and ghouls and welcome back to monster craze memoirs a generational podcast about b movies i am your host ian carcia and joining me as always is my father rocco how you doing <clears throat> so by the time you hear this episode it'll be, it'll be about a week after we recorded it i'm trying to get these out of the can as quickly as possible so that uh, maybe after we wrap this month's uh, series of films, I'm, I'm thinking we'll, we'll just go ahead and take a break. I won't stop recording episodes, but I'll, I'll put a, I'll put a dad into, back into the tool shed for a while. Let him, you know, get his get his rest. Uh, Allergies. In the meantime, though, it is a very special day. Again, it'll be a week before you hear this, but it is uh, Rocco's birthday today, so wish him a very happy birthday. How old are you now, Dad? 69. 69. Jesus. Uh, how are you feeling about it? 69. <laughs> uh, how does 69 feel versus, uh, versus 65? You're older. <laughs> you don't move as fast. <laughs> You're always looking for something new, so... Yeah, and now the clock's ticking. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, so uh, what did we watch? Uh, for, oh, so this month I, I figured that, you know, since it'll be the month, uh, we'll go on break. I'll keep recording a few episodes. I'll do them a little more casually. I'll, I think I'll just sort of, you know, I'll try to do my, my due diligence and research, but I think I will just start doing some episodes that are a little more casual. I'll watch films without any particular theme, and then I'll just upload them. Uh, so for this month, before we go on our little break, I figured that we would just uh, cap off this first season of Monster Craze Memoirs with some of Dad's personal favorites. We actually had made a short list of movies that you wanted to revisit yeah, again. Yeah, right. Uh, so th this one, w what was the movie we watched for uh, this week? Hideous Sun Demon. All right, so uh, what is it about the Hideous Sun Demon? Why do you think it stuck out in your mind among the among the virtually hundreds of trashy B movies you probably saw on TV or in the drive-in when you were a kid? Um, I don't know. When I was younger, it was just I thought it was a. Um, I always was captivated by the um, the simplicity of the movie. Um, but also, I'm always fascinated with California. So, the California setting is is used in this, and the other movies you see it as well. So they use it pretty effectively, um, showing the. One of the interesting things they show is the developments right next to the Derricks, and the, you know uh, yeah for the, the sort of climax of it it gets into the, the sort of fields. outskirts of L.A. that right. you don't normally well Torrance see. Torrance and things like that yeah you get outside that yeah that's what it looks like so it's very interesting how they tie them all together. Um, you know, a lot of these B-movies end up using the same sort of, like, uh, forests or deserts and canyons in and around Los right. Angeles. But All you're the right, there, there aren't a lot of ones. I mean, I guess a lot of them do take place in, like, small Southern California towns and sort of rural right. areas. But you're right, there. I, I don't think we've ever seen one that has at least the climax of the movie but a lot of it sort of occurs right. in this sort of this sort of borderland right. between the urban center of uh Los Angeles and the and where you start to get into the kind of the deadlands the places that are well, mostly was it, Santa, was it Santa Monica Santa Monica right that's yeah, where, I think it's that's where we saw the sign yeah. right so of course they could be anywhere in California right. and see a sign for Santa Monica so um, but it looked like that was the hilliness of it. It's approach to the beach, 
things like that. That's uh, that's always great. Settings. Yeah, a lot of it was shot around. Yeah, Santa Monica. Well, the bar scenes were done in Santa Monica. Like there's a uh, and the but a lot of the beach scenes are done around uh, in Malibu and in uh and in Long Beach. Interesting, which are great. And great those settings. oil fields and uh, those oil fields where the movie has its climax are actually on Signal Hill. So again, like the sort of. We get a nice little variety of California, you know, from the uh, sort right. of the the dreamy, you know, w- one of those classical places for a sort of dark tale of of descent can occur in a California setting, which is in those, you know, those uh, hilly shoreside. Right. You uh, may think it's almost po- Alaska. Yeah. <laughs> with <laughs> with their long right. winding right. roads and their steep cliffs that where you well, know if, one if, false one false move or one dark it, like, play, thought play, sends play, you over play, the edge. Well, and play misty for me, right? Yeah. Play, again, you can, there's a lot of places you can go in California and be totally removed from the great city, right? So and you, you those settings come into into play and it's it's you're right, it's barren. Or you go to Palo Alto, it's exactly the same way. You know, a guy, to, a guy, a motorcycle guy can own a, a spread as big as a rich guy in a three-piece suit in the bar. So it's kind of interesting. You get all these mixtures in California. Yeah. And it, these movies have, it's a great backdrop for movies. Ch- the, um, uh, yeah. the, the Monster of Piedras Blancas, which also Yeah, involves, very similar. Yeah. It's in Maine, though, I think. I think it's more because it has a lighthouse. I well, think it takes place in Maine, I think, but I don't right. think... Uh, that, so that's sure. an interesting movie we should actually add to we'll the... Def- we'll definitely be addressing the Monster of Piedras right. Blancas at some point, because that one actually has an interesting production history all by itself. I didn't know that. Okay. Uh, but just on the same beat about uh, locale and environment, I think, you know, I think probably Chinatown is the first Hollywood movie that really just fully represents not just the variety of locales that are in Southern California, but the sheer, like, ungodly bizarreness of there being, like, this pristine uh, playground of the elite's city, this Xanadu of hopes and dreams being in this place where, you know, what Chinatown does very effectively is that it shows you that metropolis, but then it just shows you, you know, just a few miles away is just absolute death in all directions. Mm -hmm. And it really communicates the kind of, like, unnaturalness of California as a setting, that this place that is constantly on the fringe and really should not exist in the way that it does and that you know and of course like it's it is part of the illusion isn't it that uh well you know because you know it's like you know the california you know like urban southern california especially in los angeles and in hollywood its ability to be self-sustaining is predicated upon this illusion of a prosperity of resources of natural resources that I think Chinatown does a very good job of illustrating as kind of a myth where of course the whole plot of Chinatown is you know based on actual history attempts to monopolize water resources sure. just right. recognizing that yeah we we've already exhausted our main water resources right. we now well, it's need built to... on the desert right yeah exactly right so yeah so anyway so the, I, li- I like the settings I think you have to admit unfortunately for this picture Although not completely, is that the last final scenes are probably the best part of the whole picture. Yeah, the climax is, de- like, I was... In terms of its... Just, in, in terms I was of never film. outright disliking the film up right. until that point, but the climax does kind of, like, take off into its own new direction. Yeah, it it's felt, almost a, a separate story. It's it felt very much like the movie was shot more or less sequentially. Mm-hmm. And that this and this was the end of their shooting, and so they really were on fire about... Uh, about re- yeah the and i think part right, of it and is, all the shots right yeah i mean you part, said they were, what did you tell me you said they were overdoing their wide angle shot it was you said something like that or well they were re- it seems like once they're able to get <laughs> out of their of their original settings which are a lot of really boring interior, interior spaces shape, right? <laughs> that are not photographed terribly well whether it's a bar or a doctor's office or even the it starts to get a little better once we move into, like, this... Like, again, this is another character who is, like, a scientist who lives in some coastal... Like, a coastal palace. Like, a whole... 
it, you know, like this whole it's not a palace, but it's a, yeah, I know what you mean. Though. Right. It's like you know, it's like it, for anybody like you know the, the sort of place that has a wine cellar and a uh, and you know it has this beautiful sort of um, post Spanish right, uh, like many California homes do. Right? Yeah, and so like e- there it starts to get a little better. Where because I you know I noticed as soon as we had a scene of our our protagonist in his house where he's just sitting at his uh, table you know getting drunk, I noticed that oh it's like okay so here we get our deep focus wide shot emulating Orson Welles. You know, here's where we start to see the permutations of the people behind the film maybe having some, like, a, a very thin and modest veneer of actually trying to do something. And then we get into the climax in all the way out in the nice, wide, arid, yeah, like, Deathland-like expanse of Signal Hill and the oil fields and gas storage uh, yeah, well, you think, tanks think about out the, there. You know, this, I mean, like even in the sadist, right? Those those final those shots of the scenes where people are killed and where he finally yeah. dies. Well, the sadist. That's is, exactly true. Man, how many times do we go to California? Don't go off. Don't go off the trail because there's right. rattlesnakes. Remember? Yeah, I mean the we I, I mean, to, the sadist is a little different because it's like from beginning to end. That's a virtually perfectly photographed movie. Yes, it is. It's a, it's yes. a very. It's and we should eventually get to the sadist. Yeah, uh, but. Anyway, I suppose. But, but, to draw but, but no, things, you're yeah. right that there's it, the cinematography suddenly gets leaps and bounds better, and not just the cinematography, but the overall construction right. of the scenes and the Point quali- of views. and the quality mm-hmm. of the editing gets a million times better the moment we reach our climax and we're all the way out onto the just the very edges of Southern California society. And of course it's where we have to have our tragic denouement for our, uh, right. Our Dr. Jekyll stand in, in this movie, who is our, uh, so let's, I guess let's just go ahead and get, into well, it has, this movie or, has all the tropes. First of all, it has the, the basic, not only should you not drink and drive, but you shouldn't drink and split the atom. That, that we learn, <laughs> that we learn right off the bat. Um, then uh, the other trope that we see is the female that's in denial about the guy being a drunk? Yes, yes. And that that bothered me a lot. I mean, it just bothered. I just can't you can we have one well, Barbara Stanwyck kind of character? A say character you're a who's drunk, not lying to smack, herself. Right, exactly. Who doesn't need to get smacked I, around to I, brought to her senses? And I hate these tropes that you get in some of these movies. But you know, what are you gonna do? But I thought it was. I guess it was easy to write. Um, so, and it has to be the guy to tell me that he knows all as I do. He, all right. So, yeah. So who is our, who is our protagonist? Who is the, uh, the scientist? I don't know who... his name. He's that Robert Clark's the actor, but what's the, uh, what's the, his name? Well, I guess the names don't matter. So let's just say it's Robert <laughs> Clark, Dr. Robert Clark. Uh, so who is Robert Clark? Cause you knew him before, uh, Hideous Sun Demon, or you know him from other places. No, well, I saw, I saw him on the King family, uh, variety special he's married to alice king or one of the kings and so he was on the on the program as a he he's a good vocalist so apparently he sung a lot with with, with the king family and i when i i, I saw that he had his son demon first because mm. i think he wrote a book but i think it's from beat um from B movie, uh, something from B to B or something like to be to be or not to be. Yeah, to be or not to be. He and wrote talks a about sort of his, memoir about, about his B experience movies, right? about being an actor in, B and then movies. eventually trying his hand at being a director. Right. Of so I, I, I didn't read the actual thing. I think it's 1994. He wrote that quite close. Yeah. He died in 2005, I believe. So this is probably towards his nadir, you mm-hmm. know, of whatever you want to call it. If there is a nadir to uh, this kind of. Anyway, what were you asking me? Well, let's just, like, get into the process. So, Dr. Robert Clark, what yeah. is... I, I mean, I guess if we can keep... Well, no, let's... Dr. Robert Clark, what is he, um... He ex, He's a radiologist, I guess. I have no idea. Like, I guess he must be a radiologist because somehow he gets exposed to radiation. Right. Of um, a, new, a unique isotope we don't know anything about. Right. Which is unusual because... You know, you usually need like a university to have some. Anyway, so well, maybe they but, are university funded. It's another, yeah. It's like, a, but I like the way they. Well, the guy does all the explanatory stuff like in five sec, five minutes. What happened, right? Yeah, there's a uh, sort of a doctor. Um, uh, fuck. I, I yeah, this is the thing. I probably should have like actually figured out these characters' names. You can look them up. Oh yeah, uh, Frederick uh, Patrick White plays an older scientist. 
who seems like he's supposed to be like the mentor figure. Right. You're right. This movie has like all of the stock <laughs> characters. It has the it has the brash young scientist who is playing uh you know in those domains where man was not meant to tread. It has his dependent girlfriend in the form of Patricia Manning. And it has his mentor, Patrick White, who is there to explain everything that would have been too expensive to make an entire uh, open right, and sequence and about. There isn't too much ex- explanation of what happened, but right. I just thought it was interesting that... He, yeah. I just Once again, radiation is the problem. So right. he's, he's exposed to the radioactive isotope. So what are, we, are you, what are we dealing with here? Is it a Jekyll and Hyde situation, would you say? Hmm. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's Jekyll and Hyde, right? So it's the, but not really because he he uh, he doesn't have a a mean character. He's not a mean person, right? Right. Because in one scene he comes rushing in. He doesn't kill anybody. He just goes to try to find a dark. He place. only seems to kill when he's frightened or when he's threatened, right? Right. 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 So, so it's maybe even less of a Jekyll and Hyde, but very closely related and more recent to the film. Maybe like the Incredible Hulk. Except, you know, he doesn't grow to fantastic size. I even made that joke, you know, but uh, while we were watching it, where it, instead of don't make me angry, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry, it's don't make me sunny, you wouldn't like me when I'm sunny. But, uh, yeah, he's a sort of, he gets exposed to this radiation. And f- so explain to us the how it is explained to the audience, because he t- basically turns into a lizard man. Right. <laughs> uh, he grows scale when he's exposed to sun, sun this reacts scale. with the isotope that's is- the elements traces of the isotope that's still in his body and m- causes him to grow scales all over his body huge fangs and revert to an animal uh state reptilian to state. be d- to devolve and once again this it, it, this is an even more uh uh in in inexplicable de-evolution than we've seen previously in I Was a Teenage Werewolf, right. where somehow regression therapy to your caveman instincts turns Being you into a werewolf. A werewolf. that didn't make any sense at all. Right. At, but at least with this one, like, it, the, 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 some, ex, the, the ex, this is the interesting thing, the explanation as to why radioactive isotope plus, re, plus regression equals lizard man is much more studiously explained but makes just as little, <laughs> if not less, sense. So explain to us. Why did it stop at the chicken? Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah. Go ahead. So explain to us the the balderdash. What is the the it's the, not balderdash. the theory that well? What is the random scientific factoid that ultimately leads us to lizard man? They say because ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. So development. What the hell does that mean? Ontogeny but, means development recapitulates phylogeny which means the evolution right so if try you, try okay try right. not to use your big well, your big is. college yeah. grad school star trek so talk these, we've got very said, simple folk listening to this podcast right what he said i'm sure these people know something about basic biology anyway so the um you know as we develop we develop in a series of stages. You mean so when we're in? Okay, yeah. Get, start with like, two. You start with a single cell, right? Mm-hmm. And then you divide, and you get bigger and bigger, and then you go through a series of stages. First of all, you're like a uh, an amphibian, so you have a three chambered heart, right? And then you become a. This is all from the development of the embryo right. into a fetus. We, right. We, in we, fact, you have gill arches. You, be, you actually become a fish first because you have gill arches. They're not called gill arches. They used to be. When Libby Hyman first described these many years ago in evolution, they called them gill arches because they're exactly the same as the gill arches of a fish, except we don't use them for breathing. So we we grow a the operculum of the fish, which covers their gills, grows over and then seals shut, and then the arches disappear. But the arches then replace various parts of our face mm. and our head. So. You go through this procedure. I think there's less of a reptilian stage. That's what I couldn't get. I mean, the idea is you really don't you don't become a chicken. I mean, the idea is that yes, you do go through some of it, but not every little step so pronouncedly that you would have a distinct step. Oh, this is the yeah. lizard stage. Basically, that bas- doesn't work. Basically, the summary is from 
if, during fetal during the development of a human fetus, you go through the evolution. You go through the evolutionary chain because right. all of everything that we are is basically just inherited exactly. from every previous generation all, all the way down preserved, to, right. so even as you're growing as from an embryo into a fetus like your your rna is your D, or your dna as it's um uh growing well the dna is not growing but as you, the fetus is development liter literally the dna is going through all of this millions of years old code yes getting to this yes. point that says okay here's where the gills are supposed to that's be that's right oh wait here's the cancel procedure over well, it's not cancel what it is is that because if, look you would not keep these things if it became fatal you wouldn't keep these things if it was too costly they would disappear like our tail we don't have a tail we have a slight tail when we grow, but we don't right. have a long tail sticking out, except if you're in that movie, like, uh, you know, what was the name of it? He had a tail. Um, um, but um, and some people are born with tails, but they're very rare. And uh, not long ones. They're short, like three or four inches. In any case, um, you use the gill arches as a, a bridge, right. as, as a structure. They say, okay, fine, we'll use this as our template, and we'll do something different with it. Right. You don't, they don't become gills. However, sometimes the gill will persist from your mouth or pharynx right out to your skin. So there are children that are born with these things. And they're very common where they occur like that. And so, so Because all of those analogous features of every other living form of life is something that's hardwired into our DNA. It is. So we, ha we literally have to go through, you have to go through it, changes. This, these changes. Yes. In a accelerated um, form, exactly. So right. we more or less begin for amphibians, the, the is, right. but but as you're saying, the critical f failing here is that it, there's not really a uh, reptile stage. You, no. can, you more they once you, once you no. once you get over that amphibian phase of fetal development, you more or less take on all of the qualities of a mammal. Exactly, that's exactly right. As soon as the gills grow over, you're a mammal. You're right. not, you don't look like a fish. Or you initially look like a little bit like a fish, but not a lot. And then it just, there's no reptilian, oh, that looks like a reptile. You know, it, right. it doesn't work that way. But that's, it's okay. I mean, it's all right. They said, because you don't want to be a chicken, that would look like Mr. Big Bird. So that wouldn't be anything. Yeah, that would, we be, have, yeah, we that have, would be that scary. Yeah. The point being is that we have a huge exposition right. dump in this movie right. that, again, does go through the trouble of actually explaining right. and show like, pictures. The, the, the bullshit <laughs> biology yeah. of Lizard Man. Right. And he says what happens is when he reacts with the sun, he reverts back, uh, I guess, not all the way, but... Certainly the skin, right? Right, but every time he's exposed again, the uh, process accelerate. It, it takes over even quicker. Right. So there's the danger it that... It takes longer to get out of it. Right. right. And so that's our basic overarching problem. It, you know, so... It, but, it, it goes, but they go through the length of saying, what about regular daylight? Or it's, No, it's, that's not a problem. It's, the sunlight is the right frequency. Right. The right. The fluorescent light is not going right. to turn him into right. a sunday. Right. There is, they even ask that question. There's regular... So it's they, a radiation. They go thing. through yeah. the detail. Of, right. So at least they go through the detail. They, they, they cross their T's and they dot their I's. Right. But the point being is that the, what I'm getting to is that uh, once we have that the basic premise of Sun Demon, the actual conflict of the film turns out to not actually be... Because really all that has to happen after that is that, like, you know, it's like, okay, this character just needs to quarantine themselves at least during the daytime right, we're not until, until a cure can be found. And that can already be the premise of a movie. That can already be a sort of uh, incredible shrinking man style premise where a character right. sort of goes out and, you know, experiences the night world and is constantly in fear of not being able to have this debilitating disease cured. But this movie goes one step further because it, ultimately, the actual problem is not that, the, that Robert Clark has is not is that himself. he's a, is not a hideous, not that he's a lizard man. He says he's drunk. <laughs> it's that he's an alcoholic. The equipment must have been at fault. Gil's always careful when he handles isotopes. Careful? Hmm. How can anybody be careful with a hangover? He didn't have a hangover. I was with him all morning. He had a headache. You see Gil through rose-colored glasses. I've known him since he was a first-year science major. In fact, I was the one who recommended him for this project. And I've warned him for the last time. Whiskey and soda mix not whiskey and science. 
<laughs> Which I think is actually a rather brilliant yeah. uh, conceit. Yeah. That preceding all of these... Because his failure, he has to go out and get a drink. Yeah. Cause, like, the, like eventually the problem gets so bad that... Yeah, because basically even after knowing that he is a hideous sun demon now, he, go, he basically goes out one evening, gets drunk, picks up a, a girl at a bar, a, a singer at a bar goes out onto the beach and sleeps with her there over the night. And, of course, we have that classic uh, dis dissolve to black to indicate that the characters have had sexual intercourse. And then he wakes up early in the morning, and, of course, he has to run away as quickly as he can, <laughs> leaving her on the beach without right. any way to get home because he's gonna turn. It, he's about to turn into a sun demon. Right, which is cool. He's, I right. realized, I realized the, how athletic he was. He was pretty athletic. Oh, yeah, like Robert Clark uh, runs over a lot of uh, yeah, jumps, fence posts, jumps up and hills, down through roof, brush. Does it right? he, he, does, he does all of his own stunts yeah. in the movie. He, which is he, kind of he surprising. Is wearing, he is wearing the sun demon costume and makeup itself, which must have been awful to uh, right. be in, especially during the climax out in the desert. Right. But... Then, like, basically, then, you know, they get, like, a really new fancy foreign doctor. This, you know, the, the guy who has to be at the top of his fields in radiology to come top over. Top of his field and worst in acting. <laughs> yeah, top of his field, worst in acting. But, I mean, what's he got to work with here? But, you know, and basically he's got to tell the doc guy, all right, listen, you cannot go out anymore. You need to Is stay. Is that Fred Laporta? Right. You need to stay in this house, and then his, you know, his mentor figure has to be the one who's like, and that means you've got to stop drinking. Like, this is fundamentally the problem. This is not a sun demon problem. This is an alcoholism right. problem. Yeah. And then, of course, he can't, he can't do it. He has to go out that night. Well, he, has and, a, he keeps hearing, the, like, a siren call from the ocean. Right. It's he, like the booze is calling Was him. it the strange Yes. Pursuit? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so here's the song "Straight Pursuit." I couldn't stand listening to it when she was singing, and here it's replaying yeah. in his head like it's a siren call. Now, he has to go back out. Yeah. Usually, the the obligatory rock or pop songs that are in one of these movies are already uh, difficult to sit through, but <laughs> unfortunately, here we have the even worse sin of an obligatory lounge jazz. Uh, song strange pursuit the pursuit of love is a strange compelling desire though you're which is very useful if you want to have an excuse. It's a great way to pad out your movie if you have a mo if you have a scene where a character needs to sing a whole song. Right, now he wrote that, and right? You, and you, uh, the Clark didn't Clark write that song too? Uh, I think he re wrote it with uh, the uh, the other screenwriter, E.S. Okay. E. Seeley. Yeah, because I know but, he had but some then, musical. But then he had some talent. They also so. play the song twice, you know, just so that they can get as much mileage out of it as possible. It is an awful song called "Strange Pursuit," <laughs> which just is. It's. I remember one time. <laughs> You know, it's like, it's the, it's the, it's the sort of, like, the, the song on its own is awful, but, like, just the title on its, just the title alone is so, like, instantly I'm, like, thinking of, like, instantly, like, I had to ask you, is, like, were people using the term strange to refer to, like, a, a, a an extramarital, like, no, I think, tryst? I like, think with, they mean strange pursuit, they mean... Um, what do they mean? How is the pursuit of a, of a person strange? Strange pursuit probably does mean uh, extramarital. Yeah, yeah, like it has yeah, to it be. Has, like has what to could be. else? That's what else could it possibly right. be? No, that's what it means. Yes, and so right. it's like you have. I'm trying this, to think, but that's you're right. That's what it means. And so you have which this, means it's a terrible title. They could have made it something else. And so you have this mediocre actor and horrible singer, uh, Nan Peterson. She's not that bad. Well, she's a pretty bad singer. Uh, sure. <laughs> doing this, you know, she has to do this sort of smoky, <laughs> seductive, noir, back alley noir singing number. And the, but like, it is the abs, it is the mo, it is a film that is absolutely devoid of eroticism. 
because the way they communicate the sort of developing sexual tension between Nan Peterson and Robert Clark, who for all she, you know, like, there's no reason for them to be attracted to one another. He's just another boozer coming well, off I the street. Well, I think this shows his weakness. I think it shows, like, why doesn't he like, uh, what's her name, um... Who really loves him? I Patricia guess. Manning. Yeah. Yeah. Who, it doesn't because she doesn't. Well, obviously she doesn't see that he's a drunk, so a lot of good she is. Um, but you know, so but Nan Peterson. Yeah, I guess because it's just the exotic draw when you're people do stupid things when you're under stress, right? She's not under stress. No, he is. Though. But that's what I mean. Is that like you know? So, so basically, he's, like you know, he, it's he like, makes a play for her, right? Essentially, right, and she, it works somehow. <laughs> Like, That's right. like well, this is the thing. It's like, like, and this they is the thing. The, the, sedu- the, the seduction doesn't begin when he makes a move for her. The seduction begins when literally he just plops down a chair right directly in front of her piano and stares at her. And it's just the it it is the most unerotic and cre- it is one of the more unerotic and creepy scenes that we've ever seen in one of these kinds of movies which are notorious pro notoriously profligate in just the most base kind of misogyny and uh more or less more or less treating women that's you didn't like play misty for me either because you thought that was really clean eastwood film well, you know, like... I, <laughs> and that, I like that, too, because it's color and it's California. Well, Play Misty for me at least gives you an idea of, like, how a character can be informed by, like, a pathological obsession. Right. In this case, it is just because the filmmakers assume that any woman who has, like, a low-paying job as a, <laughs> as a Santa Monica <laughs> barstool singer is just immediately going to go for the first... It turns uh, out she's a mall. For somebody. The first five o'clock <laughs> shadow having come in off the street at 1 a.m. drunk who just happens to sit across from her. And yeah, of course she has the boyfriend. We There's get a like mall. a... She's a mall for some... She's the mall of some... We don't know what this guy does, but he's some kind of thug, right? He's, so, yeah, right. some kind of thug. Because he wears the hat. Right. So he, he, he gets, all stereotypes. He gets beat up in the bar and then he beats Robert Clark up later. Like, they gang up on him and mug him after he leaves uh, Nan Peterson on the beach overnight. Right. And she takes him home. Yeah. And so, that was that was also another one of the more interestingly shot scenes when they do drag him out of the bar to just absolutely kick the shit oh, yeah, out of him because right. it's all done in a long take from Nan Peterson's perspective. You're, so you're just looking down the alley as these guys rough up the guy, which is number one a great way to disguise your you know th- that you're not actually beating up Robert Clark, but you're just miming beating up Robert Robert Clark. It's a great way to obscure it. But it's also fairly effective. Like, you know, it's a weird how... I don't remember at any point in the movie actually feeling compelled by the character drama. But it is it is interesting how just the... Just the their commitment to the idea of making this a movie more or less about a character's descent into total alcohol addiction... Right. You know, basically if hitting anything, rock. Sunlight didn't accelerate his change to a lizard. The sunlight is a, it's a metaphor for his downward spiral. Right. It's like a, it's like a moment of clarity. It's like, like it's he just has sped to, up. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. he devolved both as a lizard it's and he leaving Las Vegas as a person. As a, yeah, yeah, leaving Las, Las Vegas, Vegas as a that's mad a good, science It's a very good that, <laughs> couldn't have said it better. We could have called it "Lizard Leaves Las Vegas." I don't know. <laughs> Lizard leaves Las Vegas. That was much better done, though. Yeah, that was a good one. Uh, but yeah, like the, the and I know I don't know. Right, like, I thought that's there's a lot. I mean, it, it's, it's there are a lot of good there are a lot of good um, like you said metaphors and overtones to it. Um, so it was it works out pretty well. It just isn't the tightest picture in, that you can think of. Um, well, no, it's a it's a. You but know, I like I, it, you know, I like it because it's not so complicated. So you don't have all these other subplots going on. There really isn't. It's just basically him devolving right. into a fish or a lizard That's and lizard also man. devolving to being a drunk. Um, both of them are happening simultaneously. Um, and, of course, there's no, there's no, uh, what do you call it? There's no um, salvation for him. Right. 
Because it's, because it's interesting, because it's, like, you know, it's like, and this is the thing, is that, like, there are times where, there are times on this podcast where I've accused certain filmmakers of a pretension as a bad thing. I think this is a case where, like, Robert Clark's pretensions in making this movie are the thing that keep it interesting and keep it enervating, because this is a guy who's directing, writing, producing, and starring in the film, and I don't, you know, it doesn't seem like from interviews I've read with him, it doesn't seem like that he has, like, any special affinity for the film except as something that he just remembers fondly because it was fun to do it. Like, he seems to acknowledge that it's a pretty crappy film on its own. But when you're actually watching the movie, it seems hard to... It seems hard to disaggregate... Uh, Clark's apparent lack of seriousness about making a good, out, much less a great movie, and the clear extent to which he actually did really, really try to make a movie that was about something, that, that was, you know, that used the low-budget exploitation film medium to tell a allegorical story about the nature of addiction and how, e you know, even men of such great intellect can be totally torn apart by their own base mm -hmm. instincts right. and weaknesses. impulses. Yeah, right. they're just, they're pathological weaknesses. Right. Because we're, that's the thing. He does a lot of shady things throughout the film. Not just, you know, getting drunk and going to work at the radiation facility. That probably wasn't a very good idea. But not just the cheating on his girlfriend. Like... But you never really lose. Well, I don't know if was she really his girlfriend, or was she? He didn't find, didn't realize she was his. She was his girlfriend until the end, or she always had an affection for him. It, a lot of it has, like, a lot of it has to with the daughter of Dracula. The same kind of relationship between the protagonist and and uh, his secretary or his assistant. Right. It isn't quite clear. Well, they don't have a working relationship in this movie. I they think don't. I well, think they must. I think it's pretty I think clear it's that... Hidden. I think mm. it's hidden. I think it was. There was a working relationship. She's some kind of... Uh, was it oh, yeah. I think she works at, like, the university. Right, that right. So the they, they know each other, but she probably, it's one more thing where women are more in tune to... Well, women exist to be enthralled right. with the enigmatic nature of yes, men, not exactly. to actually have any clear motivations And they just have to wait for own. the enlightenment to occur. Right. Well, just have to wait in general. Just wait <laughs> in in a room until another man says, okay, time to move to the other room, and then we go to the other room, we find out what's happening in there. It's like, all right, that's all. Go home. It's interesting about the thing. I think maybe it has something to do with that. I know you said something about the lack of, um, the lack of um, I guess, uh, care on the case of Robert Clark or whatever. But it was shot very quickly. Like yeah. twelve consecutive weekends. Yeah, and like it says here on your notes, um, and they used just used people from the university for staff and for yeah, filming so, and all yeah, that. Yeah, so right? Robert Clark at the time the movie before the move well at the time the movie was being made, Robert Clark was you know he had he had worked since at least the um he had begun his career as an, a contract player for RKO Radio Pictures but after 3 years you know his option was not re renewed so he became a freelance actor he kind of found a second That's interesting freelance he, was not that wa widely available that were, were they Well still, it became way were they more, more studio then It, it became so, way more common after the 1948 okay, Paramount okay, decision so, and basically right, every, I realized that. you know it's like uh, So it's uh, much late it's much earlier when they actually get more independent of the of we call well it's not so much about people getting more independent so much as it is They're like the, yeah factors. the studio yeah the studios are just not hiring as many stay on long-term contract actors because they're not producing as many films he does manage to find a kind of second life as a you know as a mostly as a supporting and actor and bit player but also as a star of B movies he's in a few Yep. You know, leading up to this one, he's in, uh, in 1951, he stars in The Man from Planet X. Not as The Man from Planet X, he stars as a character, right, yeah, right. the protagonist. He stars in Captive Women in 1952, which is one of those, uh, this is another weird subgenre of old B science fiction and adventure films. The subgenre of the, of the tropical locale that is 
only filled with um white women who wear <laughs> leopard pelts and and th- use spears. Uh, he was in that. He's also in the astounding she monster in, in 1958. The, um, yeah. Um, but yeah, so the the, the uh, yeah, so the astounding she monster. Which was I, I I don't know when I was a kid I didn't really. That's a, that's a very cheap, quick film. But the important thing about that one was that, uh, he in addition to his daily salary, part of Clark's contract was that he got four percent of the producer's share of the profits for the astounding she monster, and so he makes a couple thousand dollars in just over a year. And a half from being hmm. in this one really cheap uh, B movie, and so based on that, he says, "Well, shoot, why don't I try? Why don't I try doing that myself?" At the time, Clark is taking a screenwriting class at the University of Southern California, hmm. and so basically everyone in the crew of the film are just are just peep are just other university of california film students it's it's basically a glorified student film it's basically an amateur production that they managed to get a uh a distributor for uh but yeah it was shot over and, that, and it... that's the reason it was sh- that's the thing it's it was shot unusually because they did it over 12 consecutive weekends because everyone who was making the film had to go to school or if you were in Clark's case he already had an active acting career so rather than taking a break from his paying gig in order to produce right. a movie he just said oh, let's just film but it also, on the weekend also you save money right because you get an extra day over the weekend for the, when you rent the when you rent the equipment yeah Something like that. I read that somewhere. I don't know if that's in here, but... Uh, yeah, yeah. He, he basically managed to shoot the film. Well, he tried to shoot the film very cheaply. He it, The original budget for it was about $10,000, but the final production cost, mostly having to just do with, you know... And this is the thing where they get you. Because everyone, everyone who makes a small budget film back in the day where you shoot on film, at least every student filmmaker knows this, is that, like, everyone concentrates on the part where you just have to make the the production side, where you just shoot the film, you get the props, you get the actors and stuff, but then you find out that the vast majority of your budget expenses are going to be going into processing and making prints of editing, your film. whatever, yeah. Yeah. yeah all that. Even, well, even after editing, like, once you have, like, a finished... Work. So that's where you like, bang up a lot of the money. Yeah, then, so right? basically he originally budgeted it for $10,000, but by the end of the produ- production process, the thing had cost him like $50,000. How much did it make, do you know? I'm just curious. It made virtually nothing. Oh my god. Uh, cause, okay, so here's the... Yeah, th- this is a really sad story, because this is... Well, it's not a really sad story. Clark did okay for himself after this, but it's another one of these tales of these guys who try to get into the booming exploitation film game but right at the cusp of that period where they're already kind of too late to the game because where it really start really where it started taking off like the the drive-in double feature cheap black and white b movies really already started taking off in like the early to mid 50s once you're getting into 58 into the 60s even ip aip is moving in the direction of we're not doing double features anymore we're going to spend more money on single productions uh and cut costs other way like he didn't have a distribution deal when he made the movie and so he went to american international pictures because they had distributed the astounding she monster Mm -hmm. And so he arranged to screen the film at Nicholson's home, and because and this is the thing I remember back when we were reading that article for I was a teenage werewolf, the Nicholson mentioned that he shows all of his the movies that he's distributing to his daughters, as a way of like sort of judging their quality, and I couldn't tell if that was supposed to be like just him playing it up for the newspapers mm. but no apparently it turns out that james h nicholson did routinely just like you know in, in in order to decide if he wanted to you know attach himself to a movie would just show it to his daughters and say hey would kids go to see this and if they apparently they liked it it's like screen testing right right exactly <laughs> they the target audience liked it he sends him to samuel arkoff and uh you know, Sam was is open to distributing the film, 
But basically, Clark, his whole idea is that he wants to use this as a way to leverage into being behind the camera right. rather than in front of it. Right. And, and, you know, again, like AIP at this point is like moving way away from their conventional model of contracting startups to make fil- double feature films and package deals. They're really more lo- moving into the direction of bigger budget single productions and you know so sam says we really don't need any other filmmakers we've got all the producers and the you know the friendships and partnerships that we can take so clark's brother who is a sales manager and television station uh uh manager in amarillo texas he puts clark in contact with a drive uh the owner of a local drive-in who premieres the film at his drive-in uh and in attendance at, at so he basically he takes the movie on the road he goes through drive-ins right. throughout the set before well th- this was not uncommon like especially bef- so what especially I they did, he had to take it from place to place to show it well, Can't we saw that with the giant Gila monster and yeah, the killer shrew. Maybe that's it. But it really wasn't uncommon, especially if you didn't already have a distribution deal when yeah, you were making right. these movies. It was not unusual to just say, all right, we're taking this on the road. We're going to show it to places. Clark would apparently show up to some of the movies with the costume so that he could run out into the either the crowd or into the drive-in and just you know scare people as the, you know and take photographs as the monster that gets the attention of uh john and mike miller of pacific international pictures they want to get into the low budget exploitation film game and so in exchange for no money up front to distribute sun demon as a double feature with the, the movie they're trying to produce, which is a noir film called A Date with Death, they agree to sign Clark to a three-picture production deal. So Clark directs uh, a deal with Death, also taking a supporting role in the film, and the first picture that he makes for the Millers as part of the production deal is his only other movie that he produced which is beyond the time barrier which we'll also have to address at some point it'll be nice to follow up with clark as an auteur but what ends up happening is that uh pacific international pictures goes bankrupt after 18 months so in addition to only receiving his two weeks acting salary for the time barrier he gets no money off of the hideous sun demon because they're not able to distribute it so he's fifty thousand dollars in the hole on this production and the irony is that aip just ends up up buying the movie at auction and selling it to television and so that is the that is the short sad story of uh uh the little the little student amateur sci-fi film that couldn't Anyway, so aside from the aside from the fact that I just thought that like like the, some of the like you said the last for some reason I, I always I always I was curious about that though why all of a sudden it's the last ten fifteen minutes of the film the twenty minutes there when you're that it changes so it's yeah I just don't understand what happened there that that kind of it's almost like an inflection point in. Um, it's in it, brilliance. It does, yeah. It, it points of view, and you see the dark white contrast. Yeah, you, you see this at, happening uh, 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 you frequently any, in these low budget movies. But do like, you have any idea what happened at that point? Like, I think I don't think it's he something. Just got so happy I happy they're at the end. I don't think I don't think it's any particular point. I just think it distills the sort of fun that this is sort of the beauty of amateur filmmaking in general, is that. There's always this tension between the objectively bad amateurish qualities of the movie, the extent to which it can still be entertaining eaten despite or even because of that amateurishness like it has like a quaintness to it it's it right. feels like innocent and you can keep watching it and you you know you're almost like watching two films at the same time you're watching the film the person made and you're also watching it watching like you imagining the people making the film and the thoughts going through their head right but there's also the other part of it where 
the occasional moments where you see legitimate brilliance yeah. sort of just yeah. blossom out of this completely uh, disposable concept. Yeah, the vert- and, uh, vertiginous shots of the of the uh, the storage wells, you know, going up. Yeah. The, well, we had talked about that. Are, it is some like are it, slanted it, deliberately. Like, yeah. Where do we see it? There's a lot of canted photography yeah, in the, the climax. A yeah, lot so of low, the, a lot the, of low light, high contrast sort of churrasco photography. Yep. There's a scene where they're chasing him through like the um a lot, the oil a lot of tanks. Chasing. Yeah. Yeah. The, and it, uh, we had th- we had brought up we had brought up that it's like the climax is like a dead ringer for like white heat. You know, yes, it's it like was. obviously, it's like right. obviously, it's the King Kong scene because, of course, right. the, the like lizard that. man needs to climb to the top of some sort of building and then get shot off by the cop, and then we have the tragic denouement where they're standing over his body, which somehow has not splattered all over the pavement like a like an armadillo that's been run over, but <laughs> they that height, yeah, five hundred feet. Um, uh, but but I think what were we saying about the? Um... Well, what I'm getting to is that well, I guess. I mean, part of it just has to be because these were like actual film students. Yeah, they were that's a good like point. they 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 had yeah. they had nothing to lose. I mean, all right, twelve consecutive weekends, and this is the thing: is like, you know, the, they they presumably paying? they were just happy to be working on a project because you know it's like if you're a, if you're a student, like again, this is before like the real advent of motion of student filmmaking as like this actual stable way for someone to move from academia to a career in filmmaking because before like the 19 before like the early 60s you didn't get into the film industry by going to school and getting your diploma you got into the film industry by doing what everyone did which is that you just dropped everything you had you went out to California and you kept knocking on every door right. until someone right. gave and you the found time odd to jobs to take you, you found through. odd jobs right. and you work your way up you learn on the job and you know you do it just well, through, that's how you Warren, do just Warren Beatty did it that way right it's like you yeah. know it's like and <clears throat> You know, but like, you know, still in even in the late 50s, like you do have this sort of opening up of now the Academy is recognizing filmmaking as an art form because now there's also this international art film community that is being translated for American academia where you have like, you know, French and you, you know, you have like French and German film critics sort of like appraising cinema as a legitimate art form. And so now the Academy, especially in Southern California, is opening up to the idea of like, you know, in USC, I think the, I think originally the film production, well, it wasn't called film production, but their filmmaking department was really just a subsidiary of their theater department. Hmm. So like it begins as an extension of theater, but you begin educate, you you know, you you start treating filmmaking as an academic discipline where you learn not just the science of film, not just the technical qualities of a camera and how to shoot, but you also right. learn film theory. Right, you theory. also learn, right. Right. You, you, you know, it is not unhurt, it is not precisely improbable that a lot of these film students were being shown by their professors the classics of noir cinema or Italian neorealist cinema. Right. So inevitably... So because the flavors get in there. Right? right, inevitably it bleeds through, especially in the climax. I think I'm also... Um, uh, uh, the Naked City. It was also very reminiscent. The, the climax That's what I said, of yeah, that film. Naked City, yeah. But um, yeah, which I never saw until the, yeah the, the scene where they're running around and the same kind of idea. Of course, it was shot a lot better. Yeah, Naked well, City. Well, the, the Naked yeah. City also had good interior photography, yeah. and that's <clears> the <throat> thing is that like you know, and this is a thing. This is classic. This is classic film student stuff, where exteriors are wonderful. Exteriors are wonderful because all of your light is natural. You can, you know, so as long as you have don't have like someone who's a complete idiot behind your camera. It's overexposed. Y- y- right? Yeah, exactly. You, as long as you know the basics of camera and it, as long as again, as long as you're willing to experiment. As long as you're willing to say, what if we put the camera up here? What if we just climb on? And of course, like, of course, none of these people had any permits to do what you do, what they're doing. Like someone has says, well, instead of doing it from the ground, why don't we go climb and put the camera on top of this oil tank so that we can get like a 
l wide top down shot of the character running or hey why don't we do the camera lower and we'll put it in this really tight space so that we have a lot of foreground information that blocks the action right. suddenly everyone has much more opportunities to get get creative it looks like, like that's what happened but when you're doing interiors or where you're or where you're working in spaces where like say you actually had to get permission to film there suddenly like you know everything you know number one it gets harder because you know it's like okay well now we have to like put our put our education to work about lighting and we have to naturalistically light a scene right but being able to write light a scene naturally and being able to light a scene well are two completely different things and so so it's like but yeah the only really good shot like you mentioned was him drinking in his house yeah the deep focus orson well shot but again but again you see that you see the influence bleeding through you see right. like this is like this is the hideous sun demon again it's basically like what you're seeing is these film students most of whom are never going to actually have any real opportunities in the film or television industry you know, applying what they've learned in school. And it is and it is true that over the course of the film, you see them start to apply it even more and more. Like, there will even be, like, things that are, like, barely perceptible, like a like a, a zoom, not a zoom shot, but, like, a, tra a shot tracking in on a character, like, in a police station, just delivering some mindless bit of exposition just because, all right, well, maybe if we do a tracking shot here, it'll be a little less boring. Like, right. I th and I think that's it. The tension is between the everyone involved sort of acknowledging the the dramatic flimsiness of what they're doing. But at the same time, like, actually having a passion for this stuff. Like, actually thinking, well, maybe we could, you know, make a pretty it's good kind of movie funny. out almost, of this. It almost, it almost looks like they were bored with the first yeah, they part. Get, yeah, they part get bored. Film. Yeah, it's like... No, but the first part of the film that they were just not into it. Well, yeah, because it's where all... The, it's the exposition dump. Right. This is all <laughs> the stuff we, we don't care about. Right. We should talk about... I did want to touch on one bit of it. Like, you know, the the theory of how we get from um, fetal development to lizard man is already balderdash. But there is one part of the movie which... And this is the part where it does not fit with the rest of the film. Because more or less the entire rest of the film is played completely straight. As a sort of a romantic tragedy about addiction. Right. There really isn't... Any, there's like, you know, there's comic relief, but there really isn't any like overarching like black comic or ironic distance. There is, however, so I don't know quite how to explain just the sheer insult to intelligence, which is this one part where the same doctor is trying to explain like how radiation can take one organism and mutate them beyond all <laughs> right. recognition. Now... We absolutely do not need any of this justification. We already we already know schematically what radiation is supposed to do in movies. Right. But we have to have this part here because it, I guess it will pad out the running time a little more. <laughs> but he got so he okay, showed, yeah, yeah, he, he starts bugs. <laughs> yeah, he starts to Okay, so he starts showing slides of insects to expl that are allegedly been Radio exposed radiant. to radiation right but it is and this is the thing this is the most uh, patronizing <laughs> ploy that has ever been foisted on an exploitation film audience ever and for n absolutely no reason other than to elongate the film fil the film they could, have, they could have spent more time doing something else yeah what they did was basically so the doctor shows them a slide and it's a sl it is clearly a slide of a bumblebee and he says, this is a house fly after it's been exposed to radiation. And then, if that were not enough, he shows another slide. And this was the part where Dad audibly said, you've got to be shitting me. <laughs> because it's the fangs of a tarantula. And the doctor says, this was a cockroach or something? This or? was a grasshopper. <laughs> it was even worse. Just absolute bullshittery of the <laughs> highest order and like but i but like i think that just as much as the climax of the film just absolutely distills what the feeling is like watching the hideous sun yeah. demon because it is a film that should not exist 
It is like it's it's built yeah, on true. ambitions that are too. I don't know. That are too bizarre. And on asper and on economic aspirations that are too flimsy, like because this is yeah because that's the thing is that like e by 1958, if you're actually paying attention to this stuff, you shouldn't be noticing that the sea change is already coming. That like black and w you're not going to be able to sell cheap rinky dink black and white monster right. movies anymore. That's not what kids are going to see. You know, kids are going to see until it becomes fashionable. Like right. the last picture show, or right? Exactly. Like well, no, yeah, exactly. Right. Until it becomes like, yeah, until it becomes like kitsch, right? Uh, overall, though, I think I quite enjoyed it. Like, I did like, too. I right? identify with the movie because I know, <laughs> like, because I've I've been there and I know where it's coming from. Because it does it. It is the defin. Like this is one of the. This is the thing. It's like I'm not sure why, because it has its typical so bad it's good. De uh, it's not Repute. so bad. I don't think it's as bad as right, the, that's the thing. Well, it, well, it has a it has a so bad it's good reputation because yeah. so bad it's good film culture basically just takes anything that is amateurish to any degree and has to find a way to make fun of it in order to make it funny, which we've done in fair share on this. But like, I think we're in agreement that yes. like the movie is probably far more entertaining if you just go with it. Right. And just sort of accept the amateurishness. Because then you do end up the getting... The sound is really bad, too. As you oh, oh, yeah, the sound mix is terrible. Yeah. Yes, they absolutely... It sounds again, like they're talking in the bathroom. Again, this <laughs> is... And this is the thing. This is not just... That's not just a film student problem. That is, like, year one, bottom half of your class film student problem, is that the sound recording and the sound mix is absolutely dreadful. Yeah, you cannot have Except that. the bar scene was a little better, I think, in terms of... But that that was probably taped, so yeah, the pre-recorded song. Right, right. We were actually arguing about this. Like I was, like I could not believe that you thought she was actually playing, even though she's like plunking her hands down on the keyboard. Like she's playing it like she's like Danny DeVito in Batman Returns. Like she has flippers for hands, and she can only just flop the flop her. Uh, well, you never see her hands. Her mana digits down. But the other thing keys. I wanted to point out is that a lot of the killing takes off is off screen. Yeah. A lot of the killing is off screen. It's not a particularly violent movie. No, there's no. one. There's the one. Fact the violent part is when he gets beat up. Yeah, that's the most yeah, violent. Yeah, like, and the fight, the fight in the bars. They're the most violent ones. And he actually hits his head on the light, which I don't think was supposed to happen. Yeah, we yeah. There's a about. bar fight. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting that those are the more violent. Actually, but the killing scenes are not. They're all off screen. Well, they're all done in reaction. Right, like you see, like a like his mole after he gets into the, his third fight with this uh, with this gangster dude out in broad daylight. That's where the uh, it, that's where the Incredible Hulk joke had to happen. You don't right. you wouldn't like me when I'm sunny, but he uh, yeah he he starts choking the guy, and then what we get instead is like a instead of showing it, we do it in reactions. We have the mole looking out the window and, and screaming. screaming with his he's cheering. There is one interesting point that they did show a partial transformation in the final scene after he lets the girl go, the little girl. We right. have to talk about the whole scene there. Yeah, I mean, like the, again, the it's whole like part of it. Yeah, you know, basically the, the climax is built around him hiding in this uh, oil. Uh, and, and you ever really oil tank? It, well, not oil. Yeah, not an oil it, tank, it, it, but whatever shed, they call oil it. shed. An shed oil shed. Dinner. Yeah. And there's this little yeah. girl who just lives with her. Of course, there's her. a 13 million oil shed. Yeah. It's in a shed. She's, the mother's trying to run from shed to shed. Where the hell are you? Yeah, because her, her daughter is out. Because there's a killer on the loose. Right. A homicidal killer. A spree killer. And her daughter is out play, playing a tea party in the oil shed. And that's where she meets the very strange man who she goes to get cookies from her mom so that right. she can feed the hungry man. And he does kidnap her at one point. He, like, basically... Because once the police find him, he brings her with him in order to avoid them shooting at him. Right, but then he lets her go. Yeah, he does let her go. But, like, yeah, yeah, it is a pretty tense scene. Like, and again, it, it sort of illustrates that, like, you know... It wasn't all just, like, pie-in-the-sky dreaming here. There right. was, like, an actual, like, like, oh, let's, how do we make this, like, tense? And instead right. instead of going for, well, let's just make it gory, they said, like, yeah, let's, let's right. do... And, they're, and they're, they let's do... Let's do something that's a little more subtle. They do do a partial when he's yeah. transforming. They show at least one shot where he's halfway 
there yeah. to the, and then finally he's all lizard and then yeah the only other yeah. other like in this thing there's one gruesome shot in it which was edited out of tv versions of the film for a long time where it's like he picks up a rat and he squeezes it oh, but yeah. like he's yeah. clearly hiding like ketchup packets in his hand or something so that the goop will seep out and then he just drops the rat apparently he was originally supposed to like hold it over his mouth Oh. So it, to imply that he's eating the rat's innards, but they decided that that was too much. So oh, they yeah, just said, yeah, cool. so, but now he just kills the rat for absolutely no reason. But yeah, he well, kills a dog too. Oh. oh yeah, he does kill a dog. But the dog you said looks so fake when he picks it up. It doesn't. Even, it looks like a well, st- no, it, it, like it's well, it's obviously not a trained dog. The dog's obviously not attacking him. The dog thinks no, it's I think you think it was a stuffed one. I'll th- no, no, it wasn't a stuffed dog. That the was a he, real dog. The one he picked up. The real dog then, but when he finally picks him up and he throws him down, I think that was a... He said, it looked so fake. It looked like it was a stuffed dog or Maybe. something. Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to think about the... Anyway, so and that's... Again, the murders are all the killings off screen. Yeah, you sort of see a sort of... Yeah, the je ne sais quoi of the hideous sun demon. It's just like there's just something about it. Right. It does, it does keep you sort of invested to a very uh, bizarre degree. Yeah I, yeah, I think this is a movie that, like, the, this is the thing. The legacy of the hideous sun demon should not be as a so bad it's good movie. This is a movie that they should show in film studies classes. This is a film that they should actually show in film students, to film students. You know, just as an understanding of, like, like, here's what happens when all of you guys suddenly have an opportunity to just go out and make a quote-unquote real movie. So, and not to put them down, not to tell them that, like, you've got a lot to learn, to show them here's how it can go really wrong and you can make an embarrassing amateurish product right and but here's where here's where your strengths can be here's how you can like figure out how to right bend rules and apply your inspiration in a place that is that is you know that that is product that is productive and also you know it's like also it could just be used to like you know illustrate it's like look any project is work be passionate to work on a project. You don't have to. You don't have to be the auteur of what you're doing. You can like just apply your discipline, even if it's the hideous sun demon. It's like right. really the hideous sun demon. Yes, even the hideous sun demon. You can. Right. You can do something that is worthwhile because I think we would agree that like without that element to it, like this movie would be just be absolutely inexorable. Right. Right, but the idea is I didn't know anything about the fact that they had their, their students that did. Yeah, this. you just liked really, it when you were a kid because you were right. You a only weirdo. know this by looking, <laughs> looking, by doing the research on it. I thought it was good, but I liked it because I was a kid and I liked it. Just yeah, thought it, was a, it, it had a lizard man. It had a lizard man. Right. Anyway, so the model of the story is you don't drink and do science. Don't drink and operate radioactive machinery right. or any machinery. Pursuit of love has me breath.
relentless with a burning fire on and on goes the maddening chase never ending is love's strange desire strange